The last session will be presented by Theodor Parvanov, and it's about an incremental approach to formal methods in the enterprise Java applications. Oh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, thank you for uh, being actually so many to such a kind of esoteric topic. Um, I've been researching this for quite some time now, since university actually, and I've been experimenting with this uh, in my spare time and a couple of mini projects at work. So um, I would like to share my experience and my, my findings on, these, um, on this topic, which is the one that has to do with uh, program correctness. Um, how do we define it? How do we test it? And finally, how can we prove that a program is correct? Sounds kind of boring, but actually it's pretty cool. And you'll see. Um, yeah, I'm currently employed at VMware Bulgaria. Uh, I work on standing up the fully automated SDDC. Um, probably some of you have heard about this. This is the software defined data center. Um, it's about virtualization and managing uh, the software, the data centers uh, and the computing power we have uh, in a scalable and automatable and um, in an easier way, more manageable. Um, my university background is different stuff. Uh, I've been doing lots of mathematics, physics, um, and also computer science, so I've been searching for my vocation for quite some time. And I finally ended up in computer science and software engineering. Um, I did this in France, which kind of polluted my mind with mathematics because they put mathematics in everything. It's like Bluetooth. It's cooler if you put more of it. Um, yeah, so I, I have this tendency towards uh, modeling stuff uh, using uh, mathematical equations, and I find this pretty exciting. Um, yeah, computer, si computer software and programs are also part of the universe, they're stuff, so why not try and model them using equations? And um, yeah, that's what about formal verification is about, actually. A applying a mathematical theory to um, program code. Uh, and as I think, sorry, um, I think, yeah, I'm deeply convinced that <laughs> Mathematics is one of the only ways to reach the truth about the world that's around us. Um, as you know, probably most of you know that even deepest philosophical questions have their mathematical answers. Very precise. Probably the question is not that clear, but at least the answer is. Okay, let's uh, start uh, this presentation with this with an example from aerodynamics um, and see why mathematics can be useful. Um, I'm going to talk here about longitudinal stability of aircrafts. Um, um, it's, required, it's a required property of the aircraft so that the pilot and all the underlying systems that assist him do not need to spend a huge effort into maintaining the aircraft in a stable position. Um, to, to ensure this, uh, the engineers um, write some equations and do some um, simulations, computer-assisted simulations, um, based on the uh, laws of mechanics and, and fluid dynamics to ensure that the aircraft, uh, given an external perturbation like um, air gust or a gust of wind or an area of lower pressure uh, in the air, that the aircraft would not flip or and crash and burn. So this is very important. Um, so how they do this? Um, there are some equations which have been discovered in the maybe 18th century that are still valid today, of course, as in every, every point of time and every point of the universe. Um, so who wants to discuss these equations in, in depth? Well. I'm not sure I want to, but uh, uh, let's just uh, see them as um, 
an example of what I want to show, that you can attach a mathematical abstract model to an existing system, which is useful and which, which works, to reason uh, abstractly on top of this uh, mathematical model, and to reach a conclusion which is useful in practice. And this is the necessary condition for static stability of the aircraft. So if someone designs an aircraft uh, in which this relation is not uh, true, uh, then uh, the aircraft cannot be guaranteed to be stable. And this is before any testing has, has occurred or has been done. Um, so it looks pretty neat. Now, if our aircraft satisfies this mathematical relation, we're more or less sure that it won't crash once it, has, it, once it goes into, into cruising mode. Well, but this conference is not about physics or mathematics even, it's about Java. Well, um, so why don't we apply kind of the same approach to computer programs? Uh, the truth is that formal verification has been applied for a long time in, in the hardware industry. Um, embedded software, uh, where the potential cost of failure is extremely high. It could even cost uh, human lives. Um, so uh, in these industries, the uh, formal methods uh, are strictly applied to guarantee that even beyond testing, uh, that the systems that correspond to what, what has been specified and what, whatever behavior is expected uh, from them. Uh, this is mainly applied in transportation systems, uh, energy utilities and production, uh, industrial manufacturing. Um, yeah, one interesting uh, application is also in aircraft control, uh, air traffic control, sorry, um, which is um, most of the applications there are written in object-oriented software like C++ or, or Java. So yeah, they're ex expected to work in a stable and reliable way to avoid air crashes. Um, however, uh, what we do most of the time, I guess most of the people here, we do enterprise software, uh, what I would call mainstream, probably it's not a very good term, but it describes everything out of, which is a bit far from, from the hardware, a bit more abstract, uh, and a bit more related to, to business. Um, yeah, this kind of software is lagging behind in, in, term of, in terms of verification, um, but actually, we can ask ourselves the question uh, whether the errors in this kind of software are so cheap that we can... Um, and is it really so easy to modify it once it's being deployed in production? Um, I guess many of you would agree that it's not very easy and it's, even, it's, it's risky now to have bugs in this kind of software which is becoming ever more ubiquitous. Um, and it could even destroy societies. When we speak about electronic voting, uh, a software error could, could cause instability in a country, which could be a huge impact. So yeah, uh, truth is that electronic voting is partly verified in a formal way, but not entirely. And this is probably the best example in mainstream software. So Java, how can we uh, do something like what they do in the hardware and embedded software industry in Java? Uh, let's imagine, uh, yeah, here a simple interface that describes uh, a set of objects that know how to sort arrays. Uh, so here we would normally write javadoc to describe how it, this is supposed to work. This javadoc is pretty acceptable. It can be defined in many different ways, but this is one of the possible specifications of what we expect to achieve in this uh, by any implementation. And it's important that this is defined on top of the interface and not the implementation itself. So we define the contract uh, in the best in the more, most precise way we can, um, well, we don't yet have an implementation. So here is one possible implementation. You will recognize the bubble sort algorithm, which I'm, yeah, okay, it's not the best. <laughs> but uh, my point is, can we be sure that this works? So we could think of um, of course, unit testing this, bombarding it with as many po uh, as possible um, um, sets of arrays with different lengths, empty arrays, like the QE guy who entered the bar and ordered zero beers, half a beer, minus one beers, something like this. 
And we can define pretty big sets uh, of data, which could kind of guarantee that this works. However, uh, is, this, um, is this enough? Uh, many of us, I guess, we all share this experience. Uh, we find kind of, um, how are they called? The border conditions or the um, some corner cases which are not obvious from this code. And this, is, uh, this cannot often be discovered by testing. Some of them can, but mi we might have forgotten some of them. So there is no obvious way to guarantee that this uh, code that we have written here corresponds to uh, the specification on the previous slide. We should hope so, but we have to find a way to guarantee it in a more um, precise way. And the first thing is that we have to define our specification in a more um, strict language, uh, because this is English, and it, it's, first it's, it's ambiguous. Here we don't have much ambiguity, but in principle when we write documentation it's ambiguous, we miss stuff, uh, it's not precise enough, uh, and most importantly it's not automatable. So this um, text here that I have written in English is not usable by uh, a system that could potentially generate unit tests or reason uh, about the code correctness. So, yeah, small disclaimer here. Nothing scary, but I wanted to, you to be advised. Okay, can we um, think of something like this? Um, so there is some um, mathematical symbolism here. Uh, so basically, this is the same Java doc, but I wiped the, the part with the English text. Uh, I just left the top one. Uh, and I tried to replace it with what we really expect from this implementation. So we expect that the result has the same length as the input array that we have uh, provided. And if the input array is, has more than one element, uh, each current element in the result should be smaller than the, um, the following element. Uh, which is already a more precise uh, thing that even a computer could work with. But still, we don't have... Uh, I, I have uh, added this with some PowerPoint tools, so it's not very usable yet. We don't have a Java-based language that, that can uh, describe these properties uh, in a compilable way. So we need a... First of all, we need a formal system, a kind of calculus, such as we have for... Um, for physics, we use um, differential calculus, uh, algebra, which are formal systems. They're, they're systems for manipulating symbols uh, with given rules, and they have uh, semantics, meaning that they have a mapping to reality. Uh, so we need such a language for, in order to model programs as physical systems. Um, and actually, the value that we would get from this is that uh, logically proven correctness can guarantee us, can provide us guarantees of quality far beyond amount, about um, what well, any amount of testing could provide us. So we have high hopes at this point. Well, the language that uh, can do, this, do the job is called uh, first order logic, uh, and it's something that we are quite familiar with from, from high school. Um, it has, it's sufficiently expressive. And it's actually pretty intuitive, and it's sufficient to, to model program behavior, because we're interested in program, program behavior, and it has to do with the main phenomenon that occurs during program execution, and that's the modification of state under some form. Even if, if we claim to, to write stateless software, there is some state in the database somewhere. Whether it's in memory or in a database, there is state. So these uh, symbols here, uh, uh, give us a language in which we can reason about state. Uh, we have variables, of course, which can be numbers, objects, anything you can imagine from a domain. Uh, we have functions which could act upon these variables. Um, one such example is the sort function, which um, we suppose has, for example, no side effects, and it returns a sorted array one, once we provide it with a given array of numbers. Uh, sorry. Uh, we have predicates which are logical functions that, that claim stuff over the objects that we have. Uh, we have, uh, and 
two important things are the two quantifiers in this logic, which is exists. So there exists an object or a set of objects that uh, satisfy a given predicate and uh, a universal quantifier that says that for each uh, object over a given set, we have uh, a certain truth which is, which is asserted. Oh, sorry about this. It's a bit formal. It's like university, but I wanted to lay the foundations for, for what's next. Um, so here are a couple of examples. We can imagine a predicate which is called is sorted, uh, which would be equivalent to uh, what we wrote in the documentation uh, before that, which would be for each element of the array, the current element is bigger than the uh, is smaller than or equal to the next one. We can define a function which to a, an integer array associates an integer array, which would be a sort function. And then we can um, algebraically define a property of this uh, function, which is that whatever the array that we provide, the output of the sort function always satisfies this predicate is sorted. So this is a kind of way to specify uh, what we expect from our code. Oh, come on, who keeps adding those slides to my presentation? Um, yeah, the idea, <laughs> the idea is that in high school, we, I didn't need this. I, I didn't care what exactly um, sorted array meant. It was pretty obvious. Uh, and what happens when you go through, in, when, you, when you advance in mathematics throughout university, uh, you get very proficient with advanced mathematics, but you lose some basic skills. So hence these predicates here. And also the presentation. It's on the blue line, and the red line is pretty. I wouldn't make a presentation about simple mathematics. It would be a shame. Uh, so uh, yeah, what, what is, let's define program correctness. Uh, I guess all of you know what program correctness is, or you have some notion, some intuitive notion of, about this, but um, let's try and state it clearly. So first we need a specification, so a set of uh, claims about the code that we want to write, um, and a set of uh, what we would call program annotations, uh, providing meaning uh, in mathematical terms to each, of the, um, to each of the statements of the code. Uh, and actually, we use the language of first-order logic that provides uh, enough uh, precision so that we can uh, logically reason over, over these properties of the code and prove some properties. Um, of course, I'm going to give some examples afterwards, but I wanted to lay the notions first uh, as precisely as possible. Um, yeah, so we have two types of correctness. Uh, first one is the safety properties. The, this is partial correctness, which means that if our program terminates, which is not guaranteed, of course, there is a whole bunch of mathematical theories that have to do with this. Um, if the program holds, then it's, uh, it satisfies its um, specification. So its output has some relation with its input. So nothing bad happens. And th there is the other type of correctness, which is total correctness. Uh, in which we guarantee that we prove that um, a program terminates, which is not obvious at all. And well, during this presentation, I'll try to focus. Uh, just a second. Uh, I'll try to focus on on the partial correctness. Yeah. So this is what formal verification is about. We have to prove correctness of programs that have been specified in a precise way before their implementation and execution. Um, so there is some uh, formalism which is introduced with this. We have uh, some code, and it has a precondition and a postcondition. And the code is correct if we assume the precondition, some, some relation on top of the input parameters. The code executes, then the postcondition is verified. It means that the code is correct uh, compared to this uh, specification. And we denote this as the whole triple, uh, which is the, uh, we use this uh, notation here. Well, just for the sake of uh, symb symbols. But it's not very important for the, the symbol is not very important for the rest of the presentation. What, what we're really interested in is how do we apply this, all this mathematical theory to Java? Um, and actually, there is something which is not yet a standard, uh, but there has been a lot of research. It's been developed by the 
um, by several universities in the Netherlands, in Germany, and the United States, uh, which is called JML. This is the Java modeling language, uh, and it provides um, uh, a language which is embeddable into Java code and as commented annotations, so it's not really the normal standard annotations, but it doesn't influence the execution of the Java code. Um, and it provides a Java-like syntax, but it introduces some new keywords which are, uh, have to do with first-order logic. For example, for all, exists, uh, requires and ensures, uh, allow us to define preconditions and postconditions for uh, code execution. We can define invariants uh, in our code. We, we can define, so this, these are class invariants. We have loop invariants. And we have the pure annotation, which actually asserts that a method has no side effects. Uh, we saw in the previous pre presentations, especially the ones that have to do with Java streams, that side effects are not welcome. And we have to try a, a, as much as possible avoid them, because uh, if we want to model um, code with mathematical notions, uh, we have to know that mathematical objects are immutable and they are pure. They don't have any op mathematical operation, doesn't have any side effects. So uh, we're subconsciously migrating v v versus, uh, t towards this more logical model. Uh, and the implementation is provided by something which is called OpenGML here. Uh, it's a, an extension of the OpenJDK framework. Uh, and it actually allows to uh, compile these annotations into the code um, as uh, runtime assertions. And it also does some verification, which is proving stuff, but uh, this is less well developed. Um, but I'll show you some examples of both, of generated tests, uh, assertions, and uh, also we'll do a small proof at the end. Um, yeah, these are a couple of examples how this looks into the Java code, but we'll see it in the next slides as well as during the demonstration. Oh no, again. Okay, uh, again, this interface. Um, yeah, obviously we can make this more precise, of course. Well, what else is this presentation about? Okay, that's what it looks like specified in JML. Uh, it's a bit bigger, but it's much more precise. So we have... Uh, we define two types of normal behaviors for this call, uh, for this um, interface. Uh, we can also define exceptional behavior, which I haven't done here for the sake of clarity, but we can specify as much as, as we want, actually, from, from the, um, the possible implementations. So if the array is null, uh, then we just return silently null. And uh, if the array is non null, then we assert that the result would, would not be null, which is quite logical and also that the length of the result would be the same as the length of the input. Um, and also, uh, we define the post condition, uh, which would be uh, that if the, the array is more than, has more than one element, then it's sorted using this. Uh, uh, we actually replaced the mathematical expression that we saw earlier with a JML one. And also, we have asserted that the implementation has to be pure. And this is uh, verified, for example, at runtime. So if our method has some side effects, th this would explode in our face. Um, okay. So once we have all these GML annotations, all this knowledge about first-order logic, what can we do with this uh, practically? Um, yeah, actually, such a specification, it was a surprise for me, but such a specification exists for the key parts of the JDK, so some classes are already specified in this language. Um, even the, um, something which is called the JCK, I think, this is kind of a test uh, suite for, for the JDK, um, is also based on JML annotations. Um, yeah, for, for example, uh, Java doc can also be generated uh, from these annotations. And why am, am I uh, talking about this? It's because that w w the ultimate goal of what we want to do here is uh, automated verification and proof, but it's a daunting task. So I, have, I want to show you that we can split it into achievable um, middle goals. Uh, so the first uh, 
thing that we can achieve in such a way is very precise code documentation, and which is the first bullet here. Um, then, uh, once we have some cool JML annotations, we can use them as test oracles, uh, and there are um, tool suites which uh, allow generation of unit tests based on the, uh, the annotations. So this is the one I'm going to demonstrate, JML unit ng. It generates test ng suites based on the annotations that we have written. Because I, ha I really hate writing unit tests, it's so boring. <laughs> and this does the work for me. I just have to invest into the specification, which I would do anyway. Whether it's in English or in, in mathematics, uh, we would have to do it at some point. Uh, there are two other frameworks which are a bit less mature, I would say, but they're interesting because they do some statistical testing. So they basically instantiate uh, the object and then uh, bombard it with different combinations of method calls and, and parameters. So this could allow us to discover any uh, inconsistencies and discrepancies between the specifications and the implementation that we have. And the final step, the, the ultimate goal, is to do formal proof of correctness. Uh, it's a bit more complex than the rest, and I guess it's justified for the hardware and software and embedded software industry. In our case, it could be useful for uh, some key uh, internal components, some core framework code, something very reusable that we assume that just works, but you know, assumption is not very reliable. Uh, so we can do this in two steps also. Uh, one of them is manual proof, uh, which we could do by reading the code. We, we do it actually subconsciously most of the time. Uh, we do read our code after it's written, and we try to imagine how it would execute, but this would give us a more structured way of um, doing this and, and being more sure about our implementation. And there is an automated way also of proving stuff. And there are uh, two kits, uh, such as Key and OpenGML, which uh, provide integrated environments for verification. But they're a bit more complex because they require very um, good annotations, good in terms of they have to correspond to certain requirements, such as they have to be inductive. But I won't go into this much detail. My goal here is to show you that that's something we can achieve something in this area. Uh, OK, I had a computer like this when I was a kid, actually. <laughs> um, OK, let's uh, do a small demo. I have prepared a virtual machine with some demo code. So we have uh, two projects here. One is called, oh, sorry, you don't see this. Um, that's strange. OK, try to do it like this. It's a bit hard. OK, uh, so here uh, we have uh, our interface that we defined earlier. I hope that you can read it. I have increased the, uh, the font size a little bit. Um, so the two projects that, that I have are important stuff and important stuff validation. So here we're going to demonstrate uh, uh, the unit test generation uh, process. So we have uh, important stuff which contains oh, multiple packages, but let's concentrate on arrays. Uh, and we want to validate that our implementation of array operations corresponds to uh, the specification that we provided earlier. And we have uh, another project with, which would actually do the, the validation. It's more convenient to split them in different projects. Uh, I just have a single utility here which generates uh, random arrays um, with random numbers uh, that we would try to sort. And here, um, OK, so I have my terminal here. Um, and this is the GML unit ng jar that would allow us to generate the unit tests. And I would just have to type a command that I don't remember by heart, but it's in my history. So this would generate a bunch of classes. 
which are unit tests, actually testing G unit tests. And they will appear here in this uh, folder under the packages, which uh, are the same as the other, uh, what we are going to test, actually. And we see here that we have a couple of classes. Most of them are not that interesting. We have a class which is a test and which is purely generated code. No need to go into details here. It doesn't need to be changed at any point practically. What we're interested in is the other package which contains strategies for generating uh, data to um, actually run the test. And I'm going to add some data to this uh, strategy here. It's documented pretty clearly. So these are going to be data elements that are going to be sent to the sort method of the, the array operations. So I have the test data uh, util that generates random data. And let's say we are going to generate an array with 100 elements. Um, yeah, and also we can add as many as we want actually. This is the cool thing. So I just write the factories that create the data objects and don't care about how the test itself is implemented. So in this scenario, you just have to maintain your uh, specifications and provide some test data. So once we have done this, uh, we can run the project here. The output is not extremely pretty. But the idea is that we have a set of tests that have succeeded and which are entirely based on our GML annotation. So we can create uh, code coverage with almost no effort once we have the GML annotations. So yeah, sounds pretty cool. Um, so how does it work? Uh, normally, uh, it doesn't use the code, the tested code is not the code which is compiled by the Java compiler, but it's the one that uh, OpenGML has compiled for us, so it has inserted some, some assertions inside the code. Uh, so now we can try and break our uh, tests. For example, I'm going to mess my implementation here, and I'll say, just mix something up. I got it wrong. So here we're kind of doing a test-driven approach. So I have to compile this. It can be made automatically normally, but I prefer to do it manually for the sake of the demo. Uh, so here I would rerun my test ng suite, and it fails. Cool. People are happy when tests fail. Uh, and here, actually, it's well, the reporting is not very good yet. It's an open source uh, thing which is not extremely mature yet, but it gives you some hint of, uh, about what happened. And the GML post condition was false, actually. So the, the array that the function returned did not correspond to our specification, so it failed. Um, and then I can just fix my code here. I would have to recompile. And everything is back to green. And we can actually create uh, combinatorial suites of test data. We can create such test data providers uh, for uh, a given class, for a given method, and also for the, on the level of the package. So we combinatorially, we can create thousands of test cases with not such a huge effort. But this is just a step forward. Uh, the ultimate goal was proving stuff. Uh, so why not prove some, some stuff? So we want to prove that this implementation here corresponds to this specification. So let's start simple and prove this. 
Uh, I won't do the automatic proving because it requires a more complex setup and more time, but let's do it manually. It's also possible for some of the simpler cases. So um, let's prove that if the input array is null, then the result is null. We can do this simply by reading the code. Uh, and it's interesting to see where the code can exit. Uh, so it can exit here and here. Uh, if, the co if the input is null, uh, the code cannot, cannot exit from down here because it would exit here. So in this case, we can, it's pretty obvious that we return null. So we correspond to this specification here in the beginning. And what happens if uh, the other precondition is true, uh, if the array is not null, uh, then we have to prove that if the array is not null, the result is necessarily not null. Uh, can we prove this? So if the, array, uh, the input array is not null, we won't enter into this if. So we would exit necessarily here. And we could kind of backtrack uh, from where this comes from. And it comes from here. So we copy the input array, which is non-null, into the, the output uh, reference. And we do some stuff with it. And we see that nowhere we set it equal to null. So we, we have proven it. That's how the engines work, actually, the, the proof engines also. I'm just doing it manually. And let's prove something a bit more complicated, that uh, the result, the length of the result, is equal to the length of the input. So if we want to achieve this, uh, uh, we have to do the same approach. So we, we exit from here, because the input array is non-null. And here, uh, the first place where we define the output array is when we copy it from the input. So here, necessarily, they have the same length. Uh, and the next thing that, that happens during our algorithm is the bubble sort. Uh, and it does some looping here. But we can observe that in no uh, step of this algorithm, we change the length of the, uh, of the, uh, of the sorted array. And we can even define it more strongly here. We can say loop invariant. Um, so sorted dot length is equal to, uh, what was it, input dot length. So this is pretty obvious also from the code here. Um, so this here, the two arrays have equal lengths. Here we have an invariant which can be proven. Uh, it's pretty obvious here, but it can be proven also in an automated way. And here we just return the result. So we have proven that uh, this property here holds. Okay, So we have proven correctness of most of our specification. Uh, this case here is a bit more complex to prove. And actually, oh, sorry, I missed the. Well, I, I mentioned that JML has a Java-like syntax, so semicolon. <laughs> OK, and actually, uh, this also, uh, if we use OpenGML, this would also be compiled uh, into the, our code and would be verified at runtime. So if we write an algorithm that invalidates this invariant, it would break at runtime. So even if we don't prove it uh, like I did here, we can use uh, large test suites that exercise the code uh, thoroughly. And that uh, established the fact that uh, our annotations, we can hope that they're pretty uh, reliable. So um, yeah, this works. Uh, we can check, actually, if our invariant is true. Uh, invariants are really important uh, during those uh, when verif verifying software, because they are the only way to say what's going on during a loop, because a loop potentially can generate an infinity of execution paths. Uh, but there is an, always an invariant. And there is an insight I, I got, actually. Why is there always an invariant? It's why. There is necessarily a mathematical relation between all these indices and some properties of the uh, variables that we modify, which are always invariant. And according to you, uh, what, is, what never changes during this execution? Any, anyone have any idea what never changes here? Sorry? The input. the input never changes, but something else which is a bit less obvious. Well, it's obvious, but no one thinks about it. I didn't. 
Well, the code doesn't change. Sorry? Length? Uh, well, we, can, we have to prove it, but yeah, this is one of the invariants. But the invariants can, can be more or less precise. And if we want to be able to prove uh, automatically that our code is correct, our invariants have to be very precise. They have to have the inductive property. Like uh, when you do mathematical induction, you have to define your um, uh, inductive uh, property that makes it go through. So we cannot just define any property. You would need to be specific enough so that your uh, induction goes through. And here we use the same principle. Well, what's really invariant here is the code. Um, this never changes during the loop execution. And if this never changes, it means that necessarily there is a, uh, an invariant. But it's less obvious to find it, and less obvious to find uh, inductive invariants, which would allow proving automatically the code. Uh, there are tools which can assist us, actually, they, that they do code an, uh, static code analysis, and they do some uh, experimental execution of the code, which actually uh, find such invariants. They can assist us. There are some also methods heuristics that, that could help us in this. But once we have found all the useful uh, invariants here, there is an automatic proof engine that, that can prove that our code corresponds uh, to the specification, meaning that we assume, assuming the precondition, we execute the code and our, pre our post condition is met. Um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to demonstrate. Sorry, it was not very convenient. I had to turn my head to the because it didn't duplicate. There is one. Actually, this is automatically generated. When we uh, just generated the tests and I didn't fill any data, uh, there was a test which was uh, uh, attacking with zero and no, and it passed. Uh, I didn't, I actually, I didn't launch them in this configuration, but I'll show you here. So if I increase this, one of the test cases, oh, well, this one, for example, this is not one that I wrote. It was assumed by the framework that by default it would try that uh, with the no value. It was also, this is also based on our specification because we specified such a, such a case. And it, if I had defined an exceptional behavior, it would have expected an exception here. It would have been green too. Uh, and there is one with uh, zero length array. This is also automatically generated. Uh, but uh, in the comments... Yes, uh, the specification, you mean? Yeah, in the specification, you check only for null, not for zero length. Well, actually, uh, it, uh, the zero length enters here. Um, I, you see that if it's zero length, then this, is, this precondition is true. Yes, but I, I say also this, that the result's length would be the same as the input's length. And also, the other post condition is uh, an implication based on the fact that the length is strictly more than one. So if the, the array is just uh, uh, zero elements, but not null, um, we would enter in this case. Yes. You, you are not going down there. Oh, I'm not. I'm not fulfilling the uh, the entire specification, but I'm fulfilling the, the interesting part of it because uh, if the array uh, has zero elements, this part doesn't mean anything. Okay. It's a true by default because the uh, the implication. That's how the implication works in mathematics. If this is not true, then the rest is the implication is true. So we, uh, in the case where the result is zero elements, we're interested only in proving this. Yeah. And this I proved by entering in this if here. OK? Sorry, I didn't prove this case specifically. I proved just the case where it's null. But we j just did prove the other one, too. Um, OK. So back to my old computer. OK. Just a second. Uh, to shift F5, right? Oh, something is wrong. But okay, these are the uh, takeaways that I wanted to 
uh, give to you from this presentation, that formal specification is not that hard, and I think it shouldn't be reserved uh, just for the hardware and soft embedded software industry. Um, it can be introduced incrementally, and each of the incremental steps has its own value. Um, so there is no throwaway work. Uh, it's much more precise than Javadoc. Probably it's not justified to do it on every layer of the code, but at least the core components can be um, formalized and proven in this way. Uh, and yeah, these are the potential applications of the, um, uh, this uh, approach. Uh, so core project libraries, frameworks, uh, and mission-critical business rules that are usually some sort of pure methods. This is the pure business logic. And how cool is that you can go to a customer and tell him that not only you tested all his business rules, but you have also proven that they correspond entirely to what he specified. I think this could be a major, major win. Well, I still have a couple of minutes. Uh, I wanted to thank you for your attention. I hope this was not too boring. Um, and that you found it useful and you learned something new. And maybe you have some questions now, and I would be happy to answer them. Are there any tools to write the comments? Sorry? Yeah. Are there any tools to write the comments? So, because let's say I assume I figured out what the logic yeah. is. Okay. And uh, I type it, but I make a syntax error or something like that. So yes. Seems to Actually, help you with the code complete or something like that. Great question. Actually, you did so see during my presentation that I had one of the annotations wrong here, uh, the loop invariant. I had forgotten the semicolon. But um, actually, the OpenGML compiler does some verification here. And if I write something wrong, there, there is a Java, uh, there is an Eclipse plugin that does some, uh, that, that compiles this code and checks if it's uh, valid. Uh, so, yeah, it checks even more complex stuff like if I write this, it wouldn't be happy. So, yeah, you, you're assisted in this process. So, you just have to, the only thing you cannot be assisted with is writing the specifications. Ultimately, that's what code correctness uh, boils down to writing the, the good specifications and the good expectations from, from your code. But this is true even if you write the specifications in English, in a document or in an Excel sheet. Thank you for the question. So, so one more question. So would you, so it seems like the, the comment is basically a, a, a you know, like a mathemat mathematical uh, description of a unit test that I would write. Like I would start with a unit test, I would define exactly what you have in the comments in the unit test, I build the unit tests, and then I, and that, that's my, you know, that'll be, like I'll check the no, I'll check the, you know, all, all these conditions that you have, I'll, I'll do them in a unit test. Yeah. So, so, you know, like, and then I, I can auto-generate the arrays, I can write that method to just pump in all this stuff. So it seems like, like it, it's simple here for a simple case, but if yep. I had an object or something that's more complex where I had to set up the data, and the, it mm -hmm. seemed like a unit test, would give me the, it's more descriptive, like I can follow the logic. It seems like this is just for like small function, mathematical yeah. type, of, type of usage. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's we, true. Ha, where have you used it? Like, what's the real usage? Like, have you, like where have you applied this? Well, I, I want to uh, actually apply it to a real link, uh, an industrial code, like something which goes to production. But I'm still working on this. So I don't have much experience in real world applications, but I really intend to do this in the following months. And I think this can be, this has some potential. Uh, of course, more complex objects would probably not require to be entirely specified. Some, some portions of them, it could be interesting to specify them. Of course, specifying everything boils down to writing the code. Uh, but the specifications have to be abstract enough and at the same time precise enough for the case that you want to prove. So that's what I'm saying. For Java, they're, they're not justified everywhere. But in some, especially in pure methods, they can be really interesting. And we have pure methods, and more and more of them, especially when uh, treating uh, big data, when um, driving physics, physical systems such as drones, self-driving cars, they have some laws of physics which are encoded into them, and which are more or less pure, pure functions. They're, they're just uh, mathematical functions that we would want to verify. So it can be inf interesting in this case. And I want to see how far we can go into real-world uh, enterprise code, and we'll do this in a next month. Uh, could you show us a more complex uh, example of usage um, of the GML? Oh, yeah, I have, but 
I haven't generated any tests for them. We can do this online if you want, if you're not afraid to see some potential failure. Um, well, I did something for... Uh, yeah, I tried to... Uh, yeah, it's not as defined here. Not everything is specified in my, uh, where was it? Oh, yeah, it was in the e-voting. So we can imagine a class which is, uh, which models a referendum uh, in which we would have a, a data access object which stores the results. Uh, we would have the referendum ID well, we could imagine that this is persisted in some sort of, for example, object database or re relational, doesn't matter. Um, and here I have specified the uh, behavior of the uh, constructor. So the constructor of this object takes a question and also a data access object in which we can, uh, in which we can store the, uh, the results. And here I have written some specifications. Uh, actually, problem here is that uh, we cannot assert, using JML, we cannot assert anything about what's going on in the database. Because the, everything that's in the comments here has to be uh, pure with no side effects. So we don't have any way of getting information. Well, there are probably some workarounds, but I haven't experimented with this enough yet. Uh, but normally, your specifications have to be uh, pure with no side effects. So here I decided to maintain ghost state, which is actually like variables, but which are only visible to the specifications. And they're uh, compiled into the Java code. So they, they are accessible in the specifications in the same way that the Java variables are accessible there. So I have defined some behavior based on this ghost state. For example, uh, here, if uh, someone votes with a given answer, just an enumeration with yes or no. Uh, we have some code which executes here that saves the, uh, the referendum result. And here at the end, we assert that the ghost, uh, yeah, we, we set the ghost state with, uh, which has one more vote. And we, we do the same for the no case. And we can actually write some invariants based on, on these things which I I guess I haven't done here, but we can write a class invariant. Which says that uh, yes plus no equals, uh, sorry, equals total. Would have, for example, to maintain some total uh, variable. Or, for example, an easier invariant would be yes is always positive and no is always positive or zero. Well, we can think of any kind of combinations. Depends on what's useful for us. Sorry, what did I type here? <laughs> no, with a zero. <laughs> okay, that's stupid. Okay, so why isn't he happy? Let me check. He, he provides some assistance here. Okay, so this is actually a warning that uh, it's trying to prove some things behind the scenes and it can the specification is probably not sound compared to the, the code that I have written, but um, yeah, you see that this begins to look like something which could be useful. And I yeah, intend to invest more, so I ran out of time, sorry. It's lunch break <laughs> and presents, I guess. Okay, well, thank you very much. I, I, I hope you liked it. And Okay, so this was the last session of this year's J Prime. I hope you liked our conference, and I hope we all meet again next year. Uh, and with that, we'd like to thank you for being with us. And uh, yeah, I think there are still some more glasses outside on the registration. Uh, and why do we need these glasses? Michu will tell you. We'll go to South Park. It's actually a park uh, called South Park. 
Uh, we'll go there. It's a two-kilometer walk, so it's an exercise. Uh, we'll get a couple of beers. We're not paying for the beers, uh, but the beers are cheap. You get the glasses. There are still T-shirts left, so I'm not going to delay you. And yeah, uh, I'd like to invite the Adrenalinki. <laughs> Our great volunteers, please come to the stage. And I'd like to hear your big applause for them. You were awesome. Thank you. So, this was all from us. Thank you again, and grab your t-shirt. Ah, there, there is a raffle with the Okado boot. So you may rush to the Okado boot to, to, to win a fantastic prize. And if there are people from Musala here, please go to your booth and help your colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That instead that creeps under the careless foot of either. Check out.